Epilogue, June 7th, 1985. If you told me a year ago that I would be taking a summer job in an ice cream parlor in Hawkins, instead of traveling the world, my heart would have plummeted straight through the center of the earth. But all the money I saved for Operation Croissant barely covered the not one, not two, not three, but four cars I messed up on prom night including the used car lot purchase of another Dodge Dart to, to, the, to replace the one I totaled. My parents forgave me eventually, but I don't think they'll be teaching me how to drive anytime soon. The silver lining was that my parents said I could have a bike again, and even gifted me one sans flower decals, and the dead remains of streamers for, for my 17th birthday. Yes, I've crossed the edge of 17. No, my life isn't nearly as epic as that song makes it sound. But I'm only getting started. I spent junior year making everyone at school uncomfortable with my sarcasm and sartorial choices. Even the band nerds didn't know what to do with me. Odd Squad is officially a thing of the past. Miss G decided to mix it up and grouped me with three random new trumpet players. But Milton and I together occasionally, but Milton and I get together occasionally and watch MTV as he plays with his Yamaha and fills me in on how Wendy's doing at college. Kate is still with her debate club boyfriend. Their relationship seems both adversarial and adorable. Sheena Rollins and I talked a few times after prom. It turns out she's not particularly shy, but a few people at Hawkins High merit her precious, her, her precious words. We didn't have the chance to get very close, though. She graduated early, got into a prestigious fashion design program, and left Hawkins without looking back. I can't exactly fault her for that. Tammy Thompson and Craig Whitestone didn't last. Shocking, I know. But I've never really hoped she might run, but I've never really hoped she might run heartbroken into my arms. So that's progress. Oh, and I actually tried out for the full play, a student-directed production of Macbeth, and got up on stage in a cloak to play a witch on a blasted, on a blasted heath, in a move that felt suspiciously close to typecasting. Jokes on them. I loved every minute. I spent, I spent cackling. On closing night, Mr. Hauser was right there in the middle of the audience. Sitting next to a very nice looking man who he introduced after the show as Charles. Mr. Hauser got a new job teaching English in a small town in Illinois. And I've only got one more year before I can pack up and leave this place for good. I'm going to need a new source of income for that. Now that I face down the monster that is Hawkins High and live to start another day, a food service job seems, seems fairly benign, even if it's at the shrine to newness and money that is Star Court Mall. I show up on the first day of training as the mall is just opening. Its white concourses already filled with people who are far too eager to spend their time and paychecks here. The food court pumps the smell of hot dogs everywhere. Everything is bright and synthetic and bizarre, an overlit alternate universe. Right there, past the Claire's and the Walden books and the Sam Goody, waiting in all its sugary glory, is Scoops Ahoy, it's a little early for ice cream, so I expect to walk in and find the place empty, with the exception of the manager who hired me. But there's one other person sitting in a booth. I see his hair towering over the top before I see the rest of him. No, I whisper. It can't be. I keep walking to find Steve Harrington, sitting with his arm thrown over the vinyl back of a booth. 
What is he doing here? I ask the zero people and scoops ahoy. I guess I'll have to speak to Steve directly. What are you doing here? It's a free country, he says, nearly knocking me over with the force of the cliché. Then he scans me up and down with a, a lazy sort of consideration. Hey, do I know you from school or something? Oh my God, I mutter. The depths of your ignorance are astounding. I walk behind the ice cream counter, though the staff room behind it to the employees only bathroom where I don my Scoops Ahoy outfit for the first time. The white collar and puffed sleeves on the striped shirt are a little much, but I'll admit that it's sort of like the vest, the high-waisted shorts. The hat, well, the hat is an indignity that my head will just have to get used to. I fix the Ned, I, I fix the red name tag to my vest. I'm Robin. I might get you a waffle cone with double chocolate sprinkles, but I don't have to be happy about it. That's how I ended up at Scoops when I worked my way through the mall. Most of my interviews were even more disastrous than the ones I had on Main Street at Melvald's and Radio Shack. Rest in peace, Bob Newby. Despite my work experience at the movie theater, my new insistence on being an unrepentant and wholly honest version of myself all the time didn't go over so well at the Gap. I wasn't enthousi enthusiastic enough about folding t-shirts, the food court, I wouldn't um, smile on command, and the new portrait studio where people pose for soft-focused photos. I wouldn't make other people smile on command. Here at Scoops Ahoy, they only seem to care that I show up consistently and clean the ice cream scoops between every customer. Done and done. I check myself in the little mirror, the dark makeup and black nails and mismatched bracelets that are now part of my everyday look clashing with Scoops Ahoy costume in a, in a way that I find most pleasing. I leave the employee bathroom behind to find the staff room is no longer empty. Robin, we have a possible new hire that I want to get your take on, says my manager, a 30-something guy named Ned, who had escaped the sailor outfit but still has to, to wear navy blue slacks with white piping and a tie with ice cream on it. He flips some papers on a clipboard. His name is Steve... Steve... Heron. Here are seven reasons why no, I spit out. He's unreliable. He's self-centered. He shows up late for literally everything and then acts like he's doing everyone a favor when he finally jock waltzes through the door. He's going to flirt with every girl who comes in until they turn the color of raspberry ripple and he'll eat an ice cream morning, noon, and night. I see what you're saying. Ned Weedles, but I wonder if it's still worth um, hiring him because of his, well, his assets. I cross my arms, preemptively unimpressed. Are you talking about his hair? Ned shakes his head like he's not proud of himself, but he doesn't switch course. Do you know how many girls will come in and order ice cream just to be near hair like that? Believe me. Believe me, I did not have hair like that when I was younger, so I can do the math. Wait, did you hire me for my hair? I asked sarcastically, twisting the ends like I'm showing off my tresses. It's grown out since I hacked it unceremoniously on prom night. Now it touches my shoulders, naturally wavy. Thank you. Now it touches my shoulders, naturally wavy, dark blonde, or light brown, depending on who you ask. It's nowhere near the, the height of fashion. It's a non-style, an in-between color. It's mine, and I love it. Ned scoffs and buries his face in, in his clipboard. I hired you because you're a responsible young adult. That's why you're going to be in charge of him. Hmm. 
At first blush, working with Steve Harrington all summer seems like a punishment for some horrible crime in a, in a past life. But being in charge of Steve Harrington all summer? That's something I could potentially get used to. All right, I say, hire him. He'll get bored and quit by the 4th of July. Welcome aboard, scoops ahoy, ship Steve, Ned says, as he parades out of the staff room. I follow him, arms crossed, still wary. What did I just agree to? Do I have to wear that? Steve asks, pointing to my jaunty, if completely cheesy outfit. I have lived through so much since the beginning of sophomore year. Even though I heard that he and Nancy Wheeler broke up in the middle in the most bitter fashion. I get the feeling that Steve Harrington still needs an education in having things not turn out the way he wants them. Maybe I can give him a crash course. I make a disgusted noise in the back of my throat. Are you going to be this much of a prima donna about everything, I ask, because this place really gets busy. I'm nothing like Madonna, so that doesn't make so that doesn't even make sense, he says with a sudden frown. Oh, I really like him. I really like making him frown. You're going to be fine with the monotony of scooping ice cream for entitled adults and whining sticky children all summer. What happens when one of your many friends and admirers comes in and you wish you were having fun instead of instead of in here slinging another USS Butterscotch. His frown morphed slightly into a stubborn look. I can handle it. Sure you can, Rocket Man, I fire back. He runs one hand through his hair, not preening. This is a purely defensive move. I do know you, don't I? He says, squinting as Ned fills out the rest of the paperwork to make this scenario official. No, I say. You really, you really don't. Steve Harrington barely recognizes me, even though I spent an entire year of my life thinking about him and Tammy Thompson. But even if he did recognize me from school, I'm so much more than anybody at Hawkins High knows. Clicks class, he shouts, and that and then makes a, a V for victory over his head. We were in the same vic we were in the same history class, or don't you remember? I remember everything, Steve. I say sharply. I want to keep him on his toes. All right, you two. It's going to be a, a, a sweet, sweet summer, Ned says, pulling another corporate catchphrase out of his ass. Steve lets, lets you go into Scoop's gear right away. Yippee, he mutters as Ned disappears into, into the back. Hey, look, if you're going to be working together this summer, let's call a truce, okay? Steve extends a hand to shake. I don't know why you don't like me but I'm a pretty okay guy. It flashes through my head that it's possible, infinitesimally possible, that there's no more to Steve Harrington that I know about. That the look I saw on his face on prom night was more than a passing cloud in his sunny, perfect life. Then he gives the, the smart, smarmiest smile I've ever seen. Is this how he charms people? It looks even worse up close. Steve, I say sweetly. He moves a few inches closer. So used to the instant af affection of girls that he were ridiculously easy to lure in. He has no idea what he's talking, that what he's walking into here. I shake his hand and whisper. We might be co-workers, but there is no universe in which you and I become friends. He frowns again deeper this time. Well, this is going to be fun. Ned reemerges with another employee employee uniform. Two minutes later, Steve is standing in front of me, fully made over. It's fashion show. It's the fashion show of a lifetime, really. His sailor shorts are much too tight, and that hat sits on top of his hair like a tiny lifeboat about to capsize. I take it back. I love these hats. I laugh so hard I almost cry. That's just, wow. Thanks for really upping my self-esteem here. Can you do a spin, I ask, curling into the fetal position in, in, in the booth as I cackle. Steve throws the hat on the floor. Ned looks flustered, 
picking, uh, picking it up and dusting it off. Let's start you both on a Sunday construction, okay? He asked. Part of me is almost glad that I stayed in Hawkins long enough to see the great Steve Harrington working at Scoops. Ahoy. Maybe things are, are turning upside down again. The world's slowly right, writing itself. Maybe life will be different soon. Now that I've fully, now that I've been my, fully myself for a year, I know there's no going back. As it turns out, being a loner suits me beautifully. But there are times when I crash hard into the hope of finding um, my people. Friends who would um, stick with me through anything. A girl I can have a less hopeless crush on. Oh, and if you haven't done it yet, and if you're still with me, please smash, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. I'd appreciate it. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe, even though we're almost to the, to the very end of the book. There are adventures waiting for me. I know it. But first, I have to get through a very strange summer. I pull out the last thing in my bag, my Polaroid camera, and take another picture for my collection. It flashes, then makes the intense click as the white paper rolls out from the front. Steve lunges to grab the photo, but I get it first and start to vigorously shake it because that's what you have to do to develop it. As it, slows, as it slowly develops, my smile spreads. I'm framed to the front, smirking, while Steve sulks behind me in a sailor suit. Oh, this is perfect. Now, nah, no, he says. Destroy that right now. Sorry, I say, pocketing the, the photo in my oversized shorts. I need souvenirs. He rolls his eyes and crosses his arms, acting like the overgrow, overgrown child that he is. Are you going to be like this all summer? He squints at my name tag. Robin? Oh, Steve, I say sweetly. I'm just getting started. All right, you guys. I'm going to read um, her acknowledgments in another video. Um, and again, thanks for um, listening to me. Bumble Through uh, Stranger Things. Rebel Robin by A.R. Capetta. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this book. And I will be starting a new book here very soon. I think I've already done a couple chapters and that's gonna be Stranger Things Runaway Max. And then after that, I'm gonna be reading Stranger Things Suspicious Minds. And after that, I'm gonna be reading Stranger Things, what is this one called? Stranger Things Worlds Turned Upside Down. The end. Thanks you guys. See you in the next video.